Well, as you certainly know by now, today is Palm Sunday, uh, the, the first day of... of uh, and I just want to uh, take a moment be, before I begin this morning to uh, encourage us uh, to, to be especially mindful as we live our lives this week as to uh, what this week really is and, and what it signifies. There is a temptation, I think, to, to jump straight from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday and, and to lose sight of, of what happens in, in between there. I, I suggested to all of you who get my uh, weekly email on Friday uh, that, that all of us uh, take the time this week and uh, pick one of the Gospels or a couple of them if you want to and, and read through the last week of, of Jesus' life. Begin at uh, uh, Palm Sunday and, and, and read the rest of the chapter, which would be pretty much the last week of, of Jesus' life. Uh, in Matthew's case, that begins in, in Matthew chapter 21, uh, the text we're going to look at this morning. Uh, but um, uh, Mark, Luke, and John also uh, have accounts of, of Palm Sunday and events that took place in, in Jesus' life during Holy Week. And I encourage you just to uh, spend some time uh, reading the scriptures this week. also encourage you to come to our Good Friday service where we will uh, pay special attention uh, to the things that went on during Thursday and Friday of Jesus' life. But for today, uh, we're going to focus on what, what happened today. Uh, today is Palm Sunday. On, on Palm Sunday, uh, Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, he didn't ride a donkey because he had gotten tired out and he couldn't walk any further. He came on a donkey because it was the fulfillment of a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And uh, we'll see that here in just a minute when I, I read the, the text. During, uh, during this time, this was the time of, of the Jewish Passover feast, and it was Jewish law that, that every Jewish male who lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem, and in, in reality they came from much further than that, were required to be there in Jerusalem for this, this, this most important of all of their, their festivals, the Passover festival. So there were literally tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of extra people in Jerusalem on this day when Jesus rode into town on a donkey. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm, I'm going to read Matthew's account of that. It begins in uh, chapter 21, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses. It reads like this. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the, mountain, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And uh, uh, this next verse here is the prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It reads like this, verse 5, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. May God add his further blessing to the reading and the hearing of these words. So when, when Jesus entered Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday, the, the crowd received him like a king. They, they, they waved palm branches and, the, and, they, and, they, and they put palm branches on the road in front of him and they took their cloaks off and, and they laid them on the road ahead of him and, and there were shouts of Hosanna, which means save now or save us now. And those were words that were generally saved to be addressed to a king. And so they thought they were welcoming a king, and there was all this excitement and all this, uh, all this cheering. But as you know, the cheering didn't last for long. Within just a matter of days, 
Many of the same people who were shouting Hosanna on Palm Sunday were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Why the sudden radical change? What happened? Why did the cheering stop is the question that I want to address this morning. I don't think there's just one answer uh, that can answer the question of why did the cheering stop? Why did so many people move from shouting Hosanna to, to crucify him? But let me, let me talk about three things this morning that may well have begun, began to change the minds of many of the people. The first thing that may have began to change some of their minds was that There we go. Jesus began to talk. Oh, now I went too far. Jesus began to talk. <laughs> All right, this thing's got the, the bleeps this morning. All right, stop. All right, thank you, Tom. All right, that's what I've been trying to say. Jesus began to talk more and more about commitment. Commitment. What is commitment? Well, let's just say that, that a brand new company comes to town and uh, they, they need to hire literally hundreds of people. And so uh, they decide that, that they will stage a hiring event, but they won't, they won't publicize it in such a way. And so they, they rent a, a, a public facility and, and, and they hang a sign out front that simply says, learn how to get an extra $1,000 every week. Friday at 7 p.m. And that's all the sign says. No one knows who put the sign up. No one knows what it's about. All people know is they can, they can, they can get an extra $1,000. And, and, and rumor goes through town that there's, that there's some new federal program or some new grant program whereby if, if you just know where to go and how to sign up, you'll get an extra $1,000. And so Friday evening rolls around and the place is packed. And there's a buzz in the air. People are excited and they're kind of giving each other high fives and they can't wait to hear the news. And when it's time to start, a man steps up to the microphone and he, and he, he introduces himself and identifies himself as the president of this new company. And he says, we've got literally hundreds of jobs that we need to fill. And he tells them a little bit more about their situation. And, and he says, and, and so now uh, all you got to do, we've got, we've got little tables set up all around the room with people sitting behind the tables. All you got to do is go and fill out an application. We've got all kinds of jobs. It really doesn't matter what your experience is, what your education is, what kind of gifts or talents you have, how old you are. We've probably got a job for you. Uh, when, when I dismiss you, you, you can just go and, and, and sign up for, the, for, for, for a job and, and we will probably hire you and all you got to do is show up on time, put forth an honest effort, and at the end of the week, if you've worked 40 hours, we'll give you $1,000. And the air just goes out of the room. Two thirds of the people just get up and walk out because they've discovered it's going to cost them something. They must make a commitment to get this $1,000. It's one thing to, to like something because you think it's going to benefit you in some way. It's another thing when that something requires something from you. In this case, commitment. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the, the crowds were all pumped up and they were waving their palm branches, which was symbolic of, of victory and success. The crowd thought they had already won something, but if they had been paying attention to the mount that Jesus was riding on, which I'll, I'll address here in just a minute, they would have realized that they thought Jesus was coming as some kind of a conquering uh, military warrior king, and, and they thought that the battle had already been won. And they were just waiting to find out what the benefits were, what they were going to gain from it. But that wasn't really the case. That wasn't the kind of king that Jesus was. John MacArthur writes, many people followed Jesus because they wanted to see healings or to receive the benefits of his miracles. But they had no interest in repentance or self-denial, in commitment, in other words. 
I want us to notice how after Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, how much time he devoted to talking about and, and doing things that demonstrated this idea of commitment. And that's part of the reason why I chose uh, uh, Matthew's account of, of Palm Sunday, because I think of all the Gospels, he does the best job of outlining some of the things that Jesus uh, did during the remainder of that week. Let me just point out uh, a couple examples. Also in, in Matthew chapter 21, in verses 18 and 19, it talks about how one morning Jesus was out and about and he was hungry and he sees this fig tree and, and he thinks that will be a way to, to get something to eat. And so he walks up to the fig tree and, and he finds that it has no figs, just leaves. Uh, which made Jesus unhappy. And so Jesus says to that fig tree, may you never bear fruit again. And the scripture says, immediately the tree withered. Essentially, this tree was a picture of false advertising, if you will. A fig tree is supposed to bear fig, figs, but this fig tree had no figs, only leaves. And Jesus uses that to remind us that we are to be fruitful Christians. We are to, to bear fruit in, in our lives, the, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on. And this parable shows us that God expects fruitful lives from his people. In John chapter 15, we have a, 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 some similar verses that remind us of this. And this is also after uh, John's account. Of, of Palm Sunday, John chapter 15, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like the branches thrown away and withers. Some branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So that's one example. We move over to verses 28 through 32, and he tells a parable about two sons. In this parable, a, a man owns a vineyard, and he says to his first son, I want you to go out and work in the vineyard today. And the first son says, no, I won't do it. But later he changes his mind, and he goes. And the father goes to the second son and asks the same of him. And the second son says, I will, sir, but he never does. And Jesus asked which of the two did what his father wanted, and the proper answer was the first. Now, one of the points or one of the lessons that we can gain from this parable is that, that God wants our obedience. And ultimately, obedience to God is what matters most. And then over in chapter 22, in verses 34 through 40, uh, there is the account of, of the religious leaders uh, trying to uh, trick Jesus with a question when they ask him, which is the most important of all of our laws? And Jesus says the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like unto it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, we are called to love God and to love others. Again, a call to commitment. And there are probably other examples that we could look to, but we see that after the triumphal entry, almost everywhere Jesus went and so many of the things that he said, he was calling people to lives of commitment, helping them understand that it was going to cost something of them. And when they began to become aware of this, some of the cheering began to subside. A Methodist bishop by the name of Kenneth Carter in Tennessee writes these words. The church of today has become an institution in which even belief in God is optional or peripheral. Marketing techniques for a multiple option institution have replaced response to the gospel of Jesus Christ as the means of membership enlistment. The basic appeal is to self-defined needs rather than a call to radical discipleship. The church's mission all too often is to meet its members' perceived needs rather than to serve God's need for a redeemed, reconciled, and healed world. I can't say that I disagree with them. In far too many cases, it is true that the American concept of consumerism has crept into the church to attract new persons and to sound appealing. We think we need to be able to say, look what our church can offer you, or look what we can do for you. 
and talk of commitment is shoved to the back burner. Commitment. It means knowing who Jesus Christ is and being willing to submit to him. Commitment means that after we shout Hosanna, we're also willing to commit to the hard work of commitment and obedience. As that first Holy Week unfolded, the people realized Jesus wasn't some kind of a warrior king after all. He was God's son, sent here to live the life of a, a committed servant. And he was calling those who want to be his followers then and now to do the same. And when many began to understand that he was calling them to this kind of commitment, the cheering began to subside. Let me suggest another reason that may have caused it to subside even more. Secondly, Jesus dared to suggest that all people are worth living. I mentioned the mount that Jesus rode. If he had rode into town on on a white stallion horse, then the people would have had reason to believe that he was coming as a conquering military hero, warrior, and king. But he didn't. He came riding on a donkey. A donkey was a sign of peace. In his commentary, William Barclay writes, So when Jesus claimed to be king, he claimed to be the king of peace. He showed that he came not to destroy, but to Not to condemn, but to help. Not in the might of arms, but in the strength of love. And I want us to see what happened on Palm Sunday. I read verses 1 through 11, which was the account of Jesus actually riding into town. But in Matthew's account, at least, look what happens immediately thereafter. Beginning in verse 12, Jesus goes into the temple. And he drives out the money changers and overturns their tables. Those who are using the temple for their own financial gain in in anger, he, he drives them out. And look what happens next. Verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him, where? At the temple. And he healed them. The blind and the lame, the sick. Those who were regarded as social outcasts of that day. After Jesus drove out the money changers, he invites and welcomes the social outcasts to come into the temple. And by bringing in these people, it's his way of saying that all people have access to God. And it's his way of saying that this is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Well, what did the religious establishment think of that? Verse 15. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, then jump down to the last three words of that verse, it says, they were indignant. Apparently it was okay with the religious leaders for greed and theft to be present in the temple. That didn't bother them. But it did bother them. When Jesus helped the social outcasts, It did bother them when Jesus helped the needy. It did bother them when Jesus healed people of their infirmities. And so we see on Palm Sunday, Jesus opened the doors of the church to everyone. That was a challenge for the church and for the leaders and the people back then. And it might even still be a challenge for us today. I came across a reading a few weeks ago that that I want to share with you, and and I think that this will uh, be uh, thought-provoking at the very least for for, for a lot of us. It goes like this. You got hammered at the bar on Saturday, but came to church on Sunday. You can sit with me. You're right where you need to be. You're a drug addict, but you came to church on Sunday. You can sit with me. You're right where you need to be. You're divorced, and the last church you attended condemned you for it. You can sit with me. You're right where you need to be. You've had an abortion, and it's slowly eating away at your heart. But you came to church on Sunday. You can sit with me. You're right where you need to be. You've been unfaithful to your spouse, but you came to church on Sunday. You can sit with me. You're right where you need to be. 
You see, here's the thing. People don't come to church on Sunday for you to sit in the pew and quietly judge them because you somehow feel like you're better than they are. People come to church because in their deepest, darkest, most painful moments, they heard about a man named Jesus that could save their souls, and they'd like to know him. The man that just snorted cocaine off his kitchen table isn't a bigger sinner than you who told your boss a lie on Monday so you could leave work early. The woman that had an abortion 10 years ago isn't a bigger sinner than you who flipped a man off in traffic last week because he cut you off. The drunk man laying on the bar isn't a bigger sinner than you who occasionally has too much to drink at home in private. The woman that just got caught cheating on her husband isn't a bigger sinner than you who had sex with your now husband before you were married. Stop judging others because their sin is different than yours. Romans 3 verses 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. There isn't a person in this world too bad too broken, too mean, or too damaged for Jesus to save. Jesus understood that. And on Palm Sunday, he opened the doors of the church to everyone. And it made some people uncomfortable. And I'd be willing to suggest that it still makes some people uncomfortable today. And when he did, the cheering began to subside even more. There's one last reason that we want to talk about today. Thirdly, Jesus began to talk more and more about the cross. In the early days of his ministry, Jesus talked a lot about heaven and the kingdom of God, and his message was largely one of grace. And people liked that message, and people wanted to hear more about it. But increasingly, Jesus began to talk about sacrifice and love and service and maybe even giving up your life. If you think about it, Jesus showed great courage to even enter Jerusalem at all on Palm Sunday because he knew what was going to happen. Look at, flip back to Matthew chapter 20, uh, verses 17 through 19. Uh, it says, now as Jesus is going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus knew what awaited him. Most of us would have probably tried to sneak into town and and hope that we wouldn't be noticed. But not Jesus. Jesus entered Jerusalem in a very deliberate and public way. The cheering stopped because Jesus began to talk about the cross, about the sacrifice, and what it means to follow our Lord. Matthew chapter 10, verses 38 and 39, Jesus says, Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus began to talk about taking up your cross and what that might involve. The story is told of a Little League baseball game. And a young guy comes up to, up to the plate to bat, and, and the coach down in the third base coaching uh, box gives him the signal to lay down a sacrifice bunt. So a little guy steps into the, to the batter's box, and the first pitch comes in, and he swings with all his might, and he misses. He steps back in the box, the second pitch comes, he swings even harder, and he misses it by even more. Third pitch, same thing. You're out. And as the teams are, 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 are changing positions, the coach comes up to the little guy and he says, didn't you see me give you that sign to lay down a sacrifice bunt? And the kid says, yeah, I saw it, but I didn't think you really meant it. I didn't think you really meant it. What about us? 
Are there times when by our words and by our actions and by our attitudes, we indirectly say to Jesus, I didn't really think you meant it when you called me to a life of commitment. I didn't think you really meant it when you said the most important commandment is, is, is to love you. I, I can do that. But I'm also supposed to love other people as much as I love myself. I didn't think you really meant that. I didn't think you really meant it. When you said following me would require me to, to live a life of, of sacrifice and dedication and, and to love other people and to welcome other people and to be willing to sacrifice even to the point that it might mean I give up my life. I didn't really think you meant it. This day marks the beginning of Holy Week. And if the events of this week, and in particular, the events of Good Friday say anything at all to us, it is this. Jesus meant it. He meant it. And he proved it. When he went to the cross and he gave up his life. So that each and every one of us could have the opportunity to be made right with God. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness, for by his wounds we have been healed. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for what you have done for each and every one of us. Lord, we, under, we recognize that on that first Palm Sunday there was great excitement and great cheering. But when the people really began to understand what kind of a king you were and what you were calling them to, much of the cheering subsided. As a matter of fact, it turned into chants of crucify him, crucify him. Jesus, we understand that you are not some kind of a conquering military king and warrior who comes ready just to hand out benefits. You come calling us to walk alongside of you in the ministry that you have. You call us to a life of commitment. You call us to a life of to, to love you and to love others just as we love ourselves. You call us to a life of welcome and service and sacrifice, maybe even to the point of giving up our lives. Lord, we thank you for what you have done for us. Make us ever mindful of that as we live our lives this week. And bless us now as we share together and the bread and the cup communion. That's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.